this is the day that the Lord has made, and we might as well rejoice and uh, be glad in it. What a joy it is to be here today, and already uh, we sense the power and the presence of the Lord permeating uh, in this room, and we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the unseen presence in this room. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in that sweet time of worship, and it is so good to see each of you. I'm incredibly grateful for my friend and the great president of this fine institution, uh, Dr. Jamie uh, Dew, and to all my brothers and sisters who are gathered in this place. I greet you this morning with the only name that matters, and that's the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I want to invite you this morning in the moments that are ours to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to study together verses 7 through 11, and I just want to read uh, verses 10 and 11. So 1 Peter chapter 4, and when you have it in your copy of God's Word, just shout amen. Hear this word from the Word. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. Use them well to serve one another. If you have the gift of speaking, then speak as if though God himself were speaking through you. If you have the gift of helping or serving others, do it with all the strength and all the energy that God supplies. Then everything you do, will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ because all the glory and all the power belong to him forever. Amen. Father, thank you for the moments you've given us now to study together the truths of your word. And God, I pray that you would speak to us in a very clear way, provide conviction, provide clarity in order that we might be better men and women, boys and girls for the glory of God. And Lord, I pray as always that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that Lord, those would be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, most of all today, let us leave this place today more in love with Jesus at the end than at the beginning. And we ask this in the strong, powerful name of our soon returning King Jesus, and we all said together, amen. I want to tag this text. I want to preach about living a life that brings glory to God, living a life that brings glory to God. I believe that the church is designed to be a place where believers walk together in love and unity. When we walk together in unity, that you and I can accomplish so much more for the glory of God. That Amos reminds us in Amos chapter 3, verse number 3, how can two walk together except they agree. And I'm convinced today that the church is designed to be a place that brings glory to God. The early church, they were efficient and they were effective because they always kept the main thing, the main thing. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 42, that early church, they brought glory because they devoted themselves to the things that really mattered. In fact, the Bible gives us commentary on that in Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' preaching and teaching, that every time they gathered together, they actually opened up the scroll, and they had an opportunity to preach and teach the Word of God. Every time they gathered together, they spent time in fellowship. The original word fellowship is the word koinonia, that they actually enjoyed really being together. They spent time in the breaking of bread. They literally, every time they came together, they remembered the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made, not on a gold cross or a silver cross, but the sacrifice that he made on an old rugged cross in order that your sins and my sins might be forgiven. And then, yes, brothers and sisters, they devoted themselves to prayer. One of the signs of a vibrant, healthy church, one of the signs of a vibrant, healthy believer is that we prioritize our biblical values. Oh, we live in a culture that devalues values, and we live in a culture where anything goes and everything is acceptable. But you and I, brothers and sisters, you and I are called to live lives that bring glory to God, that we are created in the image of God, in order that we might be on mission with God. C.T. Sud said it best. He said, the light that shines the farthest is the one that shines the brightest at home. And today, as we study this message, this message teaches you and I that we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving one another. First Peter chapter 4 is written by the Apostle Peter. 
This is the Peter that preached on the day of Pentecost, and the Bible declares that 3,000 believers were added to the local church. Also the same Peter who denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. The Apostle Peter writes this message to believers who were enduring great persecution and suffering. He writes this epistle as a word of warning and as a word of encouragement. And in verse number 7, Peter says, the end of all things is near. That Jesus was coming back and Peter knew that the next great event on God's calendar was the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says to the people of God, get ready because Jesus is coming. And in verses 7 through 11, we learn the values and the behaviors that are put on display by great commission Christians. And when these values are lived out, they result in bringing glory to God. So the question for us in our time together is simply this, how do we bring glory to God? How do our lives display and demonstrate what it means to bring glory to God? And Peter gives us four things this morning. First of all, he says, if your life and my life are going to bring glory to God, in verse 7, Peter says, we're called to pray believingly. Listen to what he says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober minded. Why? In order that you may pray. Peter suggests you and I, brothers and sisters, that we cannot be sleepy. We cannot be uh, uh, unsober, but we must be alert and we must be sober minded in order that we can pray. The early church's ministries and efforts were always marked by prayer. So Peter says, be alert and be sober minded in order that you may pray. Peter encourages believers to pray believingly. When you pray believingly, I'm convinced we should pray expectantly. Jesus teaches us the importance of prayer on the Mount of Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6, Jesus doesn't say, if you pray, but Jesus says, when you pray, go into your secret closet and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret. He will reward you openly. Jesus reminds us in Mark chapter 11, verse number 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And then the classic lesson that we learn about being expected in prayer is tucked away in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Not, and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, they will find. And the one who knocks, the door will be open unto you. We're called to pray expectantly. We're called to pray earnestly. We're called to pray eagerly. Brothers and sisters, if our lives are going to bring glory to God, we're called to pray believingly. If prayer is not our foundation, the foundation will fall apart. And if prayer is not our main business, we will soon be out of business. You see, brothers and sisters, if we're going to see a public movement from God, then we must have those private moments with the master. You see, if you depend on your organization, you'll get what the organization can give you. If you depend on your education, and we all need as much education as we can get, but if you depend on your education, you'll get what your education can give you. If you depend on your money, you'll get what money can give you. But if you depend on prayer, you'll get what God can do. And that's what we need. We need what only God can do. You see, God can do more in a moment than you and I can do in a lifetime. And so Peter says to us, first of all, in verse number 7, we're called to pray believingly. But then in verse number 8, Peter admonishes us that if our lives are going to bring glory to God, we're called to love unconditionally. Listen to these words of Peter. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. 
I love this verse because most of us know the big clause of this verse because every time we mess up, our cry is, well, you ought to forgive me because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. But I believe it is the first part of this verse that is the prelude and the foundation to making this verse come full circle. Above all, love each other deeply. This phrase, above all, simply says there are a lot of things that we're called to do, but we should place a priority and a premium on loving other people. This phrase, above all, reminds us that love ought to be the priority on our hearts. Above all, we are called not to hate each other. We are called to love each other, but not just love each other. Peter says, love each other deeply. This is not the first time that Peter uses that phrase in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22. Peter says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. This phrase, loving one another deeply, has the idea of a strenuous love and intense love. It is the same love that the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated on Calvary's cross. His love was so deep for those of us who are far from God on our way to hell. He was willing to give his life on the cross for God so loved the world that he preached, Willie, I'm doing the best I can, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but rather have everlasting life. And I love what Peter says. Peter says we know that love takes work because the proof of this love, according to Peter, is the forgiveness of sin. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. This, this phraseology about our sins being covered ought to be the hallmark of those of us who are believers of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible reminds us all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but somewhere in the providence of God, our sins too have been covered. But this is not the first time we read about our sins being covered. In the Old Testament canon, you see this in Genesis chapter 9. You see where Noah gets drunk. Noah shamefully uncovers himself. His son Ham sees his father's nakedness. Ham does nothing. He goes back and tells his family, Ham's brothers, they come back and they cover their father's nakedness and they cover their father's shame. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ did more than that for you and I. He saw us on our way to a burning hell, and his blood was shed on Calvary's cross in order that our sins may be covered, that our sins may be blotted out. He covers our sins. Yes, brothers and sisters, we need to get back to preaching on the doctrine of sin. Yes, we all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We are hopeless and we are helpless. But according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. God, brothers and sisters, there's nothing so good that you can do to cause God to love you anymore, and there's nothing so bad that you can do to cause God to love you any less. He just loves. And Peter says, if our lives are going to bring glory to God, we've got to love unconditionally. But then look what he says in verse number 9. He says, we're called to live hospitably. Listen to what Peter says. Offer hospitality one to another without grumbling. And what Peter simply says to us, we are called to offer hospitality, but we should not murmur and complain or grumble about offering that hospitality. If they are a friend of Jesus, they ought to be a friend of mine. The idea here is that the way the Lord Jesus Christ opens up his arms wide to those who are far from him, that you and I are called to live hospitably to the world. All right, in the neighborhood I live in, we, we just happen to be a black family in that neighborhood. And then we have a uh, family from Canada, so we have Canadians in that neighborhood. We have a family from the Philippines, so we have Filipinos in that neighborhood. And then we have a family from Mississippi, so we have Philipp uh, Mississippians in our neighborhood. <laughs> and um, we, we have the community trampoline. 
And, and the reason that our trampoline became the community trampoline is that our trampoline is the only trampoline that has a net on it. All the other trampolines, there's no net. So, so all the kids come to our house and they play on our trampoline. And, and my daughter who's with me today, she's got the gift of hospitality and she's given all the kids icicle pops and given all the kids Gatorade. I said, time out. I said, we're already providing trampoline. <laughs> we're, we're not making parents sign a waiver release form. And I said, it seems like to me, we're providing the trampoline. They, mom and daddy, can provide their own Gatorade and provide their own icicle pops. And uh, I, I got real spiritual, and I said, they, mom and daddy, got stimulus checks just like we did. They can go and buy their own stuff. And then Peter reminds me to offer hospitality without grumbling. Well, here's the last thing Peter says to us if our lives are going to bring glory to God in verses 10 and 11. Peter says we're called to serve faithfully. You and I are called to serve faithfully. You and I have received gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to use them well to serve one another. And I believe today, brothers and sisters, that if you are a born-again believer, that the Lord Jesus Christ has given you a spiritual gift that's been given to you to engage in the work of the ministry. Now, your gift may be different than the gift of the person beside you, but whatever gift you are given, you are called to use that gift to expand the kingdom of God. And Peter says, if you have the gift of speaking, speak as if the God himself were speaking through you. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to camp in this part of the text because this text simply says to us that you and I ought to make sure that every time we use our words that we are oracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Don't you believe that? Because that's a lie from the pit of hell. I know people who are mad 20 and 30 years about what somebody said to them. What would happen if every time we tweeted, every Every time we post it on Facebook, every time we Snapchat, every time we drop something in the Twitter world, what would happen if every time we posted something or we said something that we did it as if though we were speaking the words of God? Then Peter says, if anyone serves, they should serve with all the strength and all the energy that God supplies. Brothers and sisters, I believe that many of our places of service would be better if we could flip the statistics around. Because right now, 20% of the people are doing 100% of the work. But what if we can double that and get 40% of the people to engage in using their gifts to the glory of God? And God wants us to use our gifts to serve the kingdom of God because God God is interested in his glory. That's why Peter closes this and says, everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ because all the power and all the glory belongs to him. That's why Peter says in Colossians 3 and verse number 23, whatever you do, work at it with your heart as unto the Lord and not as unto man. And we do that because everything we do ought to result in bringing glory to God. And when our lives are result in bringing glory to God, we are simply saying, God, your hands are bigger than our hands. I close with this. Little boy went to the candy shop. Little boy wanted to get some candy. He said, sir, I want to get some candy. The man says, son, five cent will get you a handful of candy. Little boy placed his five cent on the counter. Little boy just stood there looking at the man, and the man says, son, I told you, five cent will get you a handful of candy. Little boy just kept standing there, and the man says, son, are you deaf, dumb, or slow? I told you five cent would get you a handful of candy. Little boy just stepped there and kept listening. By this time, the man's getting upset with the little boy, and the man takes his big old hand and goes inside the barrel and gets a big old handful of candy. So much candy he got that when he got ready to put the candy in the hand of the little boy, the little boy's hand was so small, the little boy had to hold out both of his hands, and the man dumped all the candy in the hands of the little boy. Little boy standing there, got a big smile on his face, laughing and grinning, and the man is still frustrated. He says, boy, what are you laughing about? He says, well, sir, you told me that five cents would get me a handful of candy. I looked at my little old hand, 
And then I looked at your big old hand, and I determined that your hands were bigger than my hands. I bid you good morning, brothers and sisters. I come by to tell you today that God's hands are always bigger than our hands. Our hands were too small to be nailed to a cross to pay for our sins, but God's hands were big enough to be nailed to a no work at cross. And in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate that he died on that cross. Uh, they put him in a bar tomb, and early on the third day morning, they raised your Jesus and my Jesus from the dead. I come to tell you, there is no door that Jesus cannot open. Uh, there is no problem that Jesus cannot solve. Uh, there is no pain uh, that Jesus cannot comfort. Uh, there is no sickness that Jesus cannot heal, and there is no sin that Jesus cannot forgive. Say yes! yes. Living a life that brings glory to God. Would you commit today to pray believingly, to love unconditionally, to live hospitably, and to serve faithfully? Would you pray? Father, thank you for the moments you've given us just to be in your presence. And Lord, we are reminded today that you can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. And Lord, thank you for reminding all of us that we exist to bring glory to God. Lord, we love you. Father, I pray your blessings upon every person gathered under the sound of my voice. And may this be our charge. May this be our commission today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Would you stand? And you're dismissed.